How are you guys doing today? Oh, come on. It's fall. Anybody watch some good football yesterday? SC. SC actually did pull it off, yeah, but I'm talking about Baylor, right? How about those bears? All right. Well, you guys aren't as excited as I am, so I'll, we'll just kind of move on past that. Hey, the, the rose thing, man, that is a huge deal. Like when, when we plant, uh, when someone trusts in Jesus, I don't know if you guys have walked around and go, why do they have so many rose bushes here? And in every one of those, we don't just kind of decorate the campus. Every one of those is someone who's trusted in Jesus. So Jason, this week, I got a chance to, uh, he was meeting with a friend of ours, Kirk and, and uh, trusted in Jesus. So that's a, just a huge deal. So if we can just one more time for the Lord, that is big, 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 big stuff. That's why we do what we do here. Um, what else was I going to say? Uh, harvest. Harvest, harvest. That is one of our major outreach events. And, and a lot of folks end up coming to church. Uh, the first time they're on campus is, it, it sounds silly, but they come because it's something for their kids to do. Uh, and they find out that church is not that scary. Uh, and so a lot of times they'll come back after that and they'll get a chance to either come to maybe KSG on a Tuesday night and bring their kids to that. Or maybe they'll come to a, mops group, a mom's group uh, on a Wednesday morning. Uh, um, or maybe they come to one of our events or they come to a worship service. And, and before you know it, they're getting to hear about Jesus. And then we have more white roses. So, so it's not just a fun event. It is a fun event. But it's something that I want to encourage you guys to be a part of. And, and candy is a piece of that. But, but also for you guys just to be here to, be, uh, to welcome our guests onto the campus. It's, it'll be a, a fun time that Sunday evening. So if you don't already have plans, just put that on your calendar on the 20th. 29th at 5 o'clock. So today we're going to continue in our book, in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews is a very, um, well, we've already seen it. It's, it's a pretty theologically weighty book. I mean, there's a lot to this book. And as we go through it, one of the things I just want to encourage you to do um, sometimes I talk really fast because I want, I have so much stuff that I want you guys to, to get a hold of. But the reality is if you guys will read through the book of Hebrews every week, uh, you know how many chapters are in Hebrews? 13. So someone's read through the, 13 chapters in the book of Hebrews. So if you read two chapters a day, you could get through the book of Hebrews in a week. And if you read through the book of Hebrews every week, while we're going through this series, just think how much uh, you would get out of the book of Hebrews. It, it's such a great book. It's so dense that, that it's hard for me to say everything I want to say and for you guys to be able to hear it that fast. So we're going to, I'm going to try to slow down a little bit as we go through it today, just so uh, we're, and if it takes us longer, you know what, it takes us longer. I'm not in a hurry. Uh, so... Chapter 1 in Hebrews, what we've already seen about Jesus. He's the Son of God, right? And what does that mean? Well, Paul says, as the Son of God, that he is the one through whom everything was made. Right? He's the creator. Paul tells us he's eternal, right? He's, he's always been. There's never been a time that the Son did not exist. He's forever that he's the sustainer of all things, that through the word of his power, everything is sustained, that he is the radiance of the Father's glory, which means he's not just a reflection, but he actually shares the same glory that the Father has. He's the exact representation of his nature. What does that mean? That means he is very God of very God. That's super important to keep in mind. Jesus is fully God, but he's also fully man, right? We've seen he's son of David, that he's the heir of all things, that he's the one who, who's sitting at the right hand of the father after he had finished his work, that through him comes purification of sins. Jesus is greater, right? Son of God and son of David. And last week, uh, Paul said, how, can, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? What's the salvation that Paul's talking about? 
Well, it's the story of the Bible, right? That way back when, (laughs) way back when, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but God made a promise that a hero would come. That he would crush the serpent's head, that he would lead God's people back to the garden. He would restore the relationship that was broken, that he would save them. And so Jesus came and he lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death. He was raised the third day, showing he had conquered both sin and death, so that by faith in Jesus, that so great salvation we too could experience. Paul's going to continue talking about Jesus today uh, as we continue in Hebrews. Please turn to Hebrews chapter 2 and let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for Jason and Lord, for a life that is forever changed, that he trusted in Jesus this week and that, that Lord, that he has experienced moving from death to life. And Lord, I pray that that would energize us as we think about the folks in our lives who don't know Jesus, that Lord, we would have a desire to share the hope that we found. That Lord, that we might see more and more folks coming to faith. See you doing just a mighty work here. And Lord, we pray as we spend time in your word this morning, I pray that that Lord, you would have freedom to move and to challenge us, to, to show us more clearly who Jesus is, that we might fall more in love with him, Father, that we might have a greater and greater desire to please him and that we could be a part of bringing many sons to glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a look at verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. In Hebrews 1, Paul emphasized Jesus as the Son of God. In Hebrews chapter 2, he's going to emphasize Jesus more as the Son of David. So when he begins this next section, that's kind of where we're turning the page. Last week, Paul ended with this incredible statement. Jesus, right, because of the suffering of death, who because of the suffering of death was crowned with glory and honor so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So we're going to do this thing. We're going to go back to Genesis. And I think it's important that we do this because it's important for us to understand how this story kind of plays out. So after God had created man, right? He, fat, he formed him from the dust of the earth, right? He, he, he put him in a garden. And he gave him a job, right? What was his job? Take care of the garden, right? To, to, to take care of the garden, to rule over creation. That was part of it, though, was to cultivate and to keep. That was part of man's job in the very beginning. Sometime later, uh, God says, but when he puts him in the garden, he says, all right, Adam, there's lots of trees in this garden. You can see it's a beautiful garden, right? Lots of, lots of things to be excited about. And, and you can imagine, again, I said this last week, but your favorite, okay, I want you to do this. What, what is your favorite, favorite flavor of ice cream? Just put it up here. And if it's not bubble gum, you're not right. I'm kidding. So whatever your favorite flavor is, maybe it's not ice cream. Maybe you're not an ice cream person. Maybe you're sherbet or whatever, uh, or cake or, or, or whatever it is. Whatever your favorite is, a bacon-flavored tree, whatever, whatever it is for you, all the trees in the garden, you could have anything to eat in the garden, anything you want, except for one. There's only one. Yeah, that one's going to be a bad tree. And if you eat of the fruit of that tree then you're going to die. And so sometime later, we don't know how long, but sometime later, uh, God fashions a woman out of one of the man's ribs. 
brings her to the man. Their first wedding takes place. And the man and his wife, the same rule is going to apply to her. She can eat from anything in the garden um, but that one tree. And the man and his woman, for some time, we don't know how long, but for some time, they got to enjoy paradise together. And I don't know if you can imagine this. There was no um, friction between the two of them. Any married folks? I don't know if you can imagine it, but there's no friction. No arguments. No disagreements. Perfect harmony with each other and with their creator. But that didn't last long. Right? The serpent shows up. And he says to the woman, he basically says, he makes this promise that if you will eat of the tree that God told you not from, because he doesn't want you to experience this, if you eat from that tree, you'll be like God. You'll know good and evil. You no longer need God. And you really don't necessarily need the guy next to you. You can be your own God. So she eats of the fruit. She gives it to her husband with her. He eats of it. And in that moment, they lose everything. Everything. Right? That perfect harmony that they had with each other, gone. The the relationship they, they had with God, gone. Creation in that moment is devastated. The perfect world that God had made is corrupted. And now death enters into the picture. And though they don't die immediately, at least not physically, they are separated from God at that moment. God's question is, where are you? Where are you? They don't die immediately. And honestly, that's God's grace on them. Why is it God's grace that they don't die physically immediately? Well, he's giving them an opportunity to repent. He gives them the opportunity to come back. He gives them opportunity to express faith when he makes the promise. He doesn't kill them immediately because if he does judgment at that moment, but he allows them to live. And they believe the promise. But the sentence of death will continue and it will pass down to each of their descendants. Who are their descendants? That's us. And not only physically would we die, but our starting point spiritually is dead. Spiritually, you start at death. And that's why when you trust in Jesus, it is a miracle. Because you're being raised from the dead. Now that's a pretty big deal. Right? You're dead in your transgressions and sins, Paul says. The wages of sin is death. That's where you start. So when you trust in Jesus, that's when you can come alive. That's when everything is reversed. Back to our passage. Paul says it was fitting for him... And bringing many sons to glory. When Paul says it's fitting for him, he's talking about God the Father. It was fitting for him to perfect the author of our salvation. Who do you think the author of our salvation is? Good Sunday school answer. Jesus, right? It was fitting for God... To perfect Jesus, the author of our salvation, through suffering. Now we have to stop for just a second. Because I thought that Jesus was already perfect. Right? Isn't Jesus already perfect? And here's the thing. Perfect has a range of meanings. So if you're talking about someone who has never sinned, right? If you're talking about moral perfection, then you are absolutely right. Jesus was perfect. He was without sin at all. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute because he had to be, right? Not only as the son of God, but to be a perfect sacrifice, he couldn't have any sin at all. So he was morally perfect. 
So then how was he perfected through suffering? And the answer is that salvation could not have taken place without Jesus' suffering and death. It could not be complete. It could not be finished. Remember what Jesus said on the cross? It is finished. That's what Paul's talking about. That for Jesus, for it was fitting, and, and it's hard for us to wrap our minds around. It was fitting. Fitting means it was the right thing for Jesus to suffer and die. It was the right thing for him to go through that for us. The just to die for the unjust. Paul says, for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. It's an interesting statement, but it's pretty incredible. It goes along with bringing bringing many sons to glory. It means that when we trust in Jesus, not only are we raised from the dead, guess whose family we get to join? God's family. That's pretty incredible. You become a son or a daughter of God the Father. A son or a daughter of the one who created it all. You become a son or a daughter of the king. And even more incredible, Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Is that not incredible to you guys? That's a big deal. Right now, God is our father and we are fellow heirs with Jesus, Paul will say in other places. That's pretty heady stuff. And Paul quotes from two chapters in the Old Testament. Right? He says, where he says, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. Right? That's in verse 12. That's from Psalm 22. And then when he says, I'll put my trust in him, And behold, I and the children whom God has given me. That's from Isaiah 8. That's in verse 13. And Paul quotes these verses to reinforce this saying that we are not just a part of, we're not just related to God because he created us. Right? And and this is the thing that we have to kind of keep in mind. Because he's used some pretty big terms about God, right? He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He's eternal. He, all these big ideas about God. And when we think about the big ideas about God, we can see God as he's somewhere out there. He's a big God. And he's got a big universe to run. And I'm just an itty bitty person. Why does he care about me? But the amazing thing is... He's no less big, but he cares about you, right? He quotes these verses to say that he, that Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren. He's not ashamed. Psalm 22. In that Psalm, when Jesus is going through what we call his passion, right? That what, you know what that means? That means the, when he's being crucified, when he's going that, that whole time, if you were, uh, around Easter when we, when we talk about the passion of Jesus, his death on a cross. He, uh, m- much of Psalm 22 is fulfilled in that, uh, in that experience for Jesus. The first half of that Psalm, the first big chunk of that Psalm talks about the one who's suffering. But here at the end, we see the one who's praising And it's that idea that suffering comes before glory. Right? When Genesis 3.15, when God made the promise that a hero was going to come, who's going to crush the serpent's head, now we know that he's going to crush his head, but you know how he's going to do that? His own heel is going to be crushed. Where does the snake bite you again? Generally, on your foot, right? As you're stepping on it. That the hero would have to die in killing the serpent. 
that suffering would have to come before glory. The Isaiah 8 passage, um, interestingly enough, Isaiah 8, you know where that is in, in the book of Isaiah? It's sandwiched between Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9. Interesting how that works, right? <laughs> Isaiah 7, I'll, I'll put that on the side. Isaiah 7 is that famous passage that Matthew quotes about the virgin birth. Behold, the virgin will be of a child and she'll bear a son and she'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. In chapter 9, then on the other side of chapter 8, we have this, uh, this passage. We're actually going to use this for Christmas this year. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. These descriptions of the Son who's going to come. And right in the middle, you have chapter 8. And this reminder that for Isaiah, the two sons that he has are going to be signs to the nation, signs to the, uh, the Israelites, signs to the Jewish people of judgment and restoration, of suffering before glory. And so here again, what, what, what Jesus wants us to pick up, I mean, what Paul wants us to pick up, Jesus does too, Paul wants us to pick up is that idea of suffering comes before glory. Let's take a look at verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted." So here's, uh, why did Jesus have to become a man? Why did he have to take on human flesh? All right, he's the son of God from eternity past. He's always been the son of God. Why did he have to take, become a man? And it's an important question to ask because he does, right? He takes on human flesh. And the answer to that question is because God made a promise that one day a hero would come. And that hero, he would be a descendant of Abraham. That he would be from the tribe of Judah. That he would be a son of David. So why did Jesus have to become a man? Why did the son have to become a man to fulfill the promises that God made? Because God said a man was going to come to save us. The hero would be a man. But it goes deeper than that. You see, only a man can die for men. Just hang with me. That's why Paul's going to say later, you know, you had the whole Old Testament sacrificial system, right? You commit sin, what do you do? You bring your bull, your goat, your lamb, whatever, you bring that to the, the altar of the high priest, uh, sacrifices the animal, sprinkles the blood, and, and here you go. Can the bull, blood of bulls and bull, goats take away sin? Answer is no. Why not? Because only a man can die for men. It has to be like for like. But it can't just be any man. Right? I can't die for your sins. Why is that? I got plenty of my own. Right? I can't die for your sins. I, I got my own to pay for. And so it had to be someone who didn't have any sin to pay for. Right? It had to be someone who was perfect. Morally. Without any flaws. It had to be someone who didn't deserve to die. 
who could step in the gap and say, I'll die for them. It had to be like for like, but kind of unlike for like. He had to be perfect. One other thing, and this is, again, I know this is kind of weighty stuff. But hang with me. God cannot die. God can't die. So Jesus, as the son of God, cannot die. You got it? God can't die. So Jesus, as the son of God, cannot die. Man can die. So Jesus, as the son of David, can die. God cannot be tempted, right? James tells us. Jesus, as the son of God, cannot be tempted. But man can be tempted. And so Jesus, as the son of David, can be tempted. Why did he have to take on flesh? Because he had to be a perfect sacrifice. He had to go through everything that we go through. He had to suffer And he had to die. And only as a man could he do that. And so Jesus becomes a perfect man and the perfect substitute. Jesus, let's just say it this way. Ironically, it's through his death, though, that he rendered powerless him who had the power of death, the devil, Right? How does the devil have the power of death? Well, in the beginning, what did the serpent do? What did he tempt Adam and Eve with? Eating from the fruit of the tree. What happens when they eat? They die. Jesus says the devil is a murderer from the beginning. He's a liar and the father of lies. He is deceptive. And he's the author of sin. But he's been rendered powerless through the death of Jesus. And by faith in Jesus, we no longer have to be enslaved, Paul says, by the fear of death. And this is important to know. What's the fear of death? And it's not just that your heart's going to stop beating. But you're going to stop breathing. You see, the fear of death or the fear in death is judgment. Right? It's what's going to happen after I die. What's out there? And it's that, that realization, as much as people want to say, oh, well, I'm just going to, nothing happens. I just cease to exist. They know. They know. Judgment is coming. Condemnation is coming. That's the fear of death. It's the fear of judgment and of condemnation. But you know what Paul says in Romans 8? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Right, that when you trust in Jesus, when he says rendered powerless, that that you're no longer enslaved to the fear of death, what he's saying is you no longer have to fear judgment or condemnation. That's no longer a part of your story because Jesus has faced it for you. And now physical death is just a stepping into eternity. Judgment has already been taken care of. And there is no condemnation. So there needs to be no fear. It's taken away in Jesus. Salvation, of course, is not for angels, right? (laughs) Angels uh, can't be saved, right? uh, uh, They're either in or they're out. There is no salvation for angels. But he says, for the descendant of Abraham. Who's the descendant of Abraham? Well, he's writing to Jewish believers. But if we go to Romans chapter 4, Paul's whole argument is, it's by faith that one becomes uh, related to Abraham. has the faith of Abraham, right? So it's not only Jewish believers, but it's also those who are related by faith, right? So that applies to all us Gentiles as well. 
And I love this. If you go, even you see this in the Old Testament, there's a couple of, of folks that, um, Gentile believers in the Old Testament. You guys remember a, a, a lady named Rahab? Not a very nice lady, but one who exercised faith with the two spies. Someone named Ruth? One of my favorites is a guy named Naaman, captain of the army, right, of the Syrians. And he's got leprosy. And they'd captured in one of their raids a little uh, Israelite girl, and so she was a slave of these Syrians. And she said, oh, that my master, (laughs) that he would go to the prophet who's in Israel and he would be healed. And so the king sends to, to Ahab, the king of Israel at that time, says, hey, heal my guy. He's like, are you trying to pick a fight? I can't, well, this is impossible. And of course, Elisha's there. He goes, yeah, send him on my way. The guy comes, he says, okay, here's what you do. You go uh, dip seven times in the Jordan River. And if you do that, then your skin will be restored and you'll be healed. And he's like, I'm not doing that. That's just stupid. The, I didn't say stupid. He said the, the rivers in, in Damascus are much better than the rivers here. And all of them are better than the Jordan River. Why would I take a bath in the Jordan River? That's just disgusting. As men say, well, if he had asked you to do some great feat, wouldn't you have done it? And he goes, okay, you're right. And once, twice, three times, nothing happens. See, I told you. Four times, five times, six times, still nothing happens. Okay, one more time. Boom. Skin is perfect. And Naaman can't wait to get back, and he shows up before Elisha and all this army that's with him, and he falls down before Elisha. He said, here, please take this gift from my hand. He says, no, I'm not going to do that. He said, then at least give me two mules loads worth of dirt from Jerusalem. Because he said, I'm not going to worship any other God but the Lord. He recognized in that moment, it's a beautiful story from the Old Testament of a Gentile believer, of someone who came to faith. And it's an illustration. Salvation wasn't by the law. It was always by the faith of of folks like Naaman and Abraham and David. So Jesus had to be like his brethren in all things, right? He had to become a man and walk among us for this reason also, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. Now, Paul's going to spend a lot of time in Hebrews talking about Jesus as a high priest, but what what was the role of the high priest in the Old Testament? You guys know? Offered the sacrifices, right? He was the guy who who stood in the gap, if you will, right? Between God and and the people, right? So he he was the one, he represented the people to God and God to the people. And he could do that faithfully because he was a man like them, right? He could faithfully represent what is a man like. He could do that because he was a man, And he could be merciful because he himself was in need of mercy. First thing he had to do was offer a sacrifice for himself before he ever offered a sacrifice for anybody else. So he knew what it, what, what it meant to need mercy. How is Jesus a perfect high priest? Well, because he was one of us, he could faithfully represent us. And he could be merciful not because he needed mercy. But because in his suffering, he was tested. And he was tempted in every way that we were. And so he could come to the aid of those who are being tempted. There is a lot in these verses. And I want to encourage you really to to read through them again. You won't get it first, first time through. Maybe listen to the sermon again. I mean, there's a lot there. But here's my hope. As you go through this book, I mean, it's, it's heavy. 
but that as you begin to, to allow yourself to time to sink in, to allow it to sink into you, the more time you spend in it, the more you're gonna, the light bulbs are gonna start to go off. The more the connections you're gonna make throughout this book and the more you're gonna see, clearly you're gonna see Jesus. And I am convinced the more clearly you see him, the more you're gonna fall in love with him. And the more you fall in love with him, the more you'll wanna be like him. And the more you will want to be a part of bringing many sons to glory. It's an incredible thought that the son of God, the radiance of the father's glory, the exact representation of his nature, the one through whom the world was made, the one who sustains all things by the word of his power. The one who is eternal, right? The big God out there. Never stop being the big God out there. But he also became the God who's right here. And I was that all along. We just didn't recognize it. He's the God that's right here with us. That everything that we go through in life does not escape his attention. He's not so busy running a universe that he doesn't have time for us. I've said this before. For those of you who are parents, you understand this. A good dad never says to his kids, I don't have time for that. A good dad never says to his kids, that's not important. You, you can go fix your toy by yourself. A good dad doesn't tell his kids just to go away and leave me alone. a good dad puts him in his lap a good dad listens to their hurts a good dad fixes the toy a good dad meets their needs a good dad loves them and God the father is the best dad there is no problem too big for him and there's no detail too small for him that he doesn't care about it. Suffering before glory, that's the reality of what it means to follow Jesus. That in this life, we are going to suffer. And we'll suffer for our faith. That's, that's been the lot of folks since the beginning. And we choose to follow Jesus. But if we remember that suffering comes before glory, which is hard to do. I know in the suffering stage, we, we, we tend to can forget about that. But, but if we remember that suffering comes before glory, that God is working through this suffering piece right now, that if we'll let him and not give up on him, he's working in it. He's working in us and he wants to work through us to do what we can't even imagine right now. He wants to make us more and more like his son, Jesus. He wants to purify and strengthen our faith. And he wants to use us, right? The minute that he's entrusted, he wants us to invest it so that we see many sons coming to glory. Jesus is the author of salvation, right? He died so that we could live. And if you haven't experienced that yet, please make today the day. And it's simple as this, acknowledging that you're a sinner in need of a savior. And that Jesus is the savior that God promised he would sin. He lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death on your behalf and he was raised the third day. That he did conquer sin and death. So that by faith in Jesus, we could have purification of sins that we could be adopted into God's family, that we could be brothers and sisters of him. We'd have eternal life. And if you want to talk about that more after the service, I'll be at the front. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today and once again for, for Jesus. 
Lord, for your perfect plan of salvation that you worked out. That we couldn't save ourselves. And so you did it for us. That Jesus, the eternal Son of God, took on human flesh for the purpose of suffering and dying for our sins to fulfill the promise that you made that one day we could have a restored relationship with you and Lord I pray that as we think on these things Lord that you would uh, draw our hearts ever closer to you that we would be amazed and overwhelmed Lord, that it would prompt us to want to share the hope that we found in Jesus, the good news of the gospel with those that we come in contact with every day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.